I love Cleveland, Ohio. I love it, I love it, I love it. And so thank you. This night is big, very big. The scope is international. The prestige is valued alongside the Pulitzer, the Nobel, the MacArthur. This is a story about stories. Stories that push, pull, startle, provoke, anger, and inform. Stories of ordinary and extraordinary people. Us. Different people, different faces, different places, different realities, and different experiences. You know, us. These are the people who wrote the stories that won Cleveland's 2009 Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. Come behind the scenes as we explore what they wrote and why. It's fair to ask, after all, they did write about us. Where does that come from? I don't know. I don't really know. I have to just sit where I am, let the voices start talking, and and keep writing down whatever whatever I get. I know that we uh, that we're more alone than we care to admit all of the time. I know that there's a certain quota of suffering and pain as well as of delusion and joy and you know redemption that we all experience. And each of these authors has their own story. So I'm pure Brooklyn, that, that's part of me. And um, after a time, as I began to sort of study and when I started writing and so on, I wanted to start kind of seeing if there wasn't that other something else to make up that world for me. I don't know. I've always wanted to try to make the most of everything that's available to me. And uh, I think probably it comes from growing up in a small town where there's not a lot to do. And I read a lot and I sort of wanted this world outside of all of this to be active and doing things. And so now I'm getting to live that. These are people who work in solitude, alone with their thoughts and pen and paper or keyboard and screen. And for two days in Cleveland, their celebrity and success is celebrated. Literary champions squired from their hotel to a podcast studio, to radio studios, and then interviews on the street in Playhouse Square. They smile, but they do admit it made their heads spin. The solitude of work will soon replace this whirlwind. Now, it all began in 1935 with an idea by Cleveland's Edith Annisfield Wolf. The Annisfield Wolf Book Awards remain the only American book prize designed specifically to honor literary works that address diversity, race, and cross-cultural themes. Owing to the vision of a poet, a poet who was wealthy and a philanthropist, who had the vision 74 years ago to endow a prize honoring excellence in the literary arts to those who would commit themselves to a better, a more just, and a more diverse world. That's Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. He's from Harvard. An historian, author, lecturer, and by the way, his friends call him Skip. He's the master of ceremonies, and he chairs the awards jury. We begin with the twisting storylines and startling dialogues spun out of the imagination of Louise Erdrich. To Louise, nothing seems sacred, but in fact, everything is sacred. Twelve novels, poetry, children's stories, and much more. I never think about the reader. You never do? No. I really just think about what to get down that would be very true in this moment. Some of the inner thoughts that you have your character share, um, it's at least trippy, sometimes stunning. <laughs> I sort of like that. Do you know how stop. the story's going to end? At some point, when you know it, then there, it really is this writing euphoria that takes over. And it is. It's, it, you always want to get back to it. So it's a journey for I you, do. too. I do. It's yeah. a journey for you. Oh, it is. And I always want to be on the journey. Louise writes with pen and paper on her journey. Here's Dr. Gates. Skip. Erdrich shows us that the differences between people and the differences between peoples are not to be taken lightly, ladies and gentlemen. That they could be steeped in brutality, in secrecy, tragedy. Reviewers call The Plague of Doves a masterpiece, dazzling, wondrous, and miraculous. The Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Fiction 
for Louise Erdrich for her great novel, The Plague of Doves. It's a story of Ojibwe Indians on and off the reservation living with whites in Pluto, North Dakota. Lives are twisted and the generations that follow are shaped and contorted by a murder long ago and the hanging of two Indians done in revenge and by mistake. Listen to Louise as her characters stumble into the murder scene. Now remember, later in the story, two of them will be mistakenly lynched. Signac tried to shut the two other men up, saying, this boy is going to be a priest. He can't hear things like that. Mushum said he and Opin walked in silence behind the two basket makers, still hoping until a Signac turned and warned them, don't step in his tracks. Mushum turned his head slowly back and forth, shifting his wad of chew and frowning as he did. The old man meant we were not worthy to step in the boy's tracks. Evil had us in those days. They walked down the road into a farmyard. Musham said he wished they had not followed the boy's tracks then. He knew there was something wrong in the beginning with the smeared door to the house wide open and no smoke from the chimney. And when they got close, the cows in the barn set up a sudden groaning to be milked and the desperation in their resonant balls stopped the men in the trampled yard. Signac set down the baskets. One of the cows screamed like a woman in pain. Let's not go any closer, said a Signac. The devil has this place. And then they heard the baby crying, a scratchy cry, a thin, exhausted wail from inside the house. A Signac turned and picked up the baskets and tried to leave. That's a baby, said Cuthbert. And he grabbed Musham's shirt and stood rooted. The baby continued now to cry as if they, it knew they were out there and they did not move. And soon the little sound died away. The wind struck up in the leggy cottonwoods. Bits of fluff whirled high. There was a clatter of stiff new leaves. A Signoc tried again to walk away, but now the cows started up even louder. I feel the devil, a Signoc cried. Look there. But Cuthbert had already gone through the door marked with blood. He vanished into the house. And when he came out, he was carrying the baby. This fellow's name is Nam Lee, born in Vietnam, raised in Australia. He pulls no punches. He throws them hard, tremendous, challenging, breathtaking, and unsparingly honest. His book is, quote, stories that snarl and pant their way across our crazed world. Part of it is made up. Part of it is faith, again, that something I feel can somehow be transplanted truthfully into someone else's mind and experience. Nam Lee's book, The Boat, gives us the circumstances and the inner thoughts of a paid teenage assassin for a drug cartel in Colombia, a dying self-absorbed artist in New York City, an American tourist dangerously caught up in protests in Iran, and Hiroshima in the days just before the atom bomb was dropped. And in one story, Nam Lee mourns the hundreds of innocent women, children, and old people slaughtered at My Lai in Vietnam. But he wonders about the perpetrators, the American GIs. Who are they? they they're us, and they're completely other than us. But I think the question you ask about how does one go on, how does one um, live with that knowledge, or that memory, or that, uh, that behavior, the knowledge, the self-knowledge that one is capable of that and has done something like that. I think that's one of the, the crucial questions of um, modern experience. I think that we all live in many ways, in many aftermaths, and that we, we consciously and constantly have to come to terms with how we live with ourselves, how we square things with ourselves, how we 
constitute our own identities after these things, and I've got no answer for that. At the Cleveland Playhouse, Nam Lee read a piece of his work that tells the story of Mi Lai through his father. His father at the time was a young boy who later became a soldier for South Vietnam, our allies in that war. When I was 14, I discovered that he had been involved in a massacre. Later, I would come across photos and transcripts and books, but that night, at a family friend's party in suburban Melbourne, it was just another story in a circle of drunken men. We arrived late, and the men shuffled around, making room for my father. For the first time, my father let me stay. I sat on the perimeter of the circle, watching in fascination. Through it all, my father laughed good-naturedly. His face so red with drink, he looked sunburned. Someone called out my father's name. He had set his chopsticks down and was speaking in a low voice. Heavens, the gunships came first, rockets and M60s. You remember that sound, you know? Like you were deaf. We were hiding in the bunker underneath the temple, my mother and four sisters and Mrs. Tran, the baker, and some other people. You couldn't hear anything. Then the gunfire stopped and Mrs. Tran told my mother we had to go up to the street. If we stayed there, the Americans would think we were Viet Cong. I'm not going anywhere, my mother said. They have grenades, Mrs. Tran said. I was scared and excited. I had never seen an American before. It took me a while to reconcile my father with the story he was telling. He caught my eye and held it a moment as though he were sharing a secret with me. He was drunk. So, we went up. Everywhere there was dust and smoke, and all you could hear was the sound of helicopters and M16s, houses on fire. Then, through the smoke, I saw an American. I almost laughed. He wore his uniform so untidily, it was too big for him, and he had a beaded necklace and a baseball cap. Then. Through the smoke, I saw Grandpa Long bowing to a GI in the traditional greeting. I wanted to call out to him. The GI stepped forward, tapped the top of his head with the rifle butt, and then twirled the gun around and slid the bayonet into his throat. No one said anything. My mother tried to cover my eyes, but I saw him switch the fire selector on his gun from automatic to single shot before he shot Grandma Long. I didn't understand it. My sisters didn't even cry. People were now shouting, no VC, no VC. Then some of them started pushing us into the ditch. One of the Americans, a boy with a fat face, was crying and moaning softly as he reloaded his magazine. When they started shooting, I felt my mother's body jumping on top of mine. It kept jumping for a long time, and then everywhere was the sound of helicopters, louder and louder, like they were all coming down to land and everything was dark and wet and warm and sweet. The circle had gone quiet. My mother came out from the kitchen, squatted behind my father, and looped her arms around his neck. This was a minor breach of the rules. Heavens, she said, don't you men have anything better to talk about? After a short silence, someone snorted, saying loudly, you win, Tan. You really did have it bad. And then everyone, including my father, burst out laughing. I joined in unsurely. They clinked glasses and made toasts using words I didn't understand. Maybe he didn't tell it exactly that way. Maybe I'm filling in the gaps. But you're not under oath when writing a eulogy, and this is close enough. My father grew up in the province of Quangai in the village of Seung Mi, in the hamlet of the Gung, later known to the Americans as Mi Lai. He was 14 years old. <laughs>